Welcome to the Mark Edit webinar series. The fourth webinar in this five webinar series will focus on a broad overview of the global functions and editing functions in Mark Edit. Terry Reese is Head of Digital Initiatives at The Ohio State University and is the creator and developer of Mark Edit. I'll now turn the microphone over to Terry. All right. Um, glad everybody who could be here could be here. Um, as always, I want to thank Carly for uh, not only um, hosting these webinars, but also uh, being kind enough to allow us to share them out with Carly. So I um, always appreciate that. So the discussion today is going to be automatic record editing in the Mark Editor. Um, this is a hard one to do in an hour, so we may go somewhat quickly, but I'm going to try and not go too fast. Because um, there's a lot of stuff that we can cover, and so there's going to be things that are going to be picked over. So what I'm going to try and do is provide um, a discussion around what uh, global editing functions are there. We'll look at um, selective editing, um, specific editing functions like find, replace, add, edits, uh, the field, swap field functions, subfield functions, copy, copy field functions. I have a set of records that we'll go through and, and look at um, how each one works. Um, I find that's usually the easiest uh, rather than having slides with lots of text on them. Uh, we'll look at the reporting functionality, um, some of the record tools, specifically uh, dedupe and cuttering, um, task automation, which is probably the most interesting, uh, one, well, one of the ones that you'll probably be interested in. Um, we will touch on harvesting because it came up as a question earlier, um, and then talking a little bit about integration with OCLC, specifically connection, but also for those that are interested, um, how you can interact with OCLC's API. Um, that's kind of what I'm going to try and cover uh, all of that. Uh, see if we can get it all done. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask, and then I will hang around a little bit afterwards if there are questions people have specifically about uh, specific maybe data questions they have. One other caveat. Um, some of the things that I talk about here will be um, some uh, things that maybe are enhanced functionality that aren't necessarily available in uh, general market right now. That's specifically going to be in the dedupe functionality. Um, updates. Uh, I'm, I'm working on an update, so I'm going to cover some things ahead of time that will be there um, within a couple of days, just, just to make that known ahead of time. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about this. So the Mark Editor, I'm assuming everybody um, knows what the Mark Editor is. The Mark Editor is the notepad that uh, lives in Mark Edit, and we're going to bounce out of it, out of these slides like usual, and actually go through it. So I, I didn't want to just screenshot images of, of the editor. Um, what I wanted to talk about specifically before we get going is that Mark Edit, Mark Editor uses regular expressions. They're probably the most um, powerful function that's part of the global editing part of the application. Um, and so I want to make sure that we get a chance to show those. So this is an example of a very simplified regular expression. And you're going to see a lot of them as we go through today. Um, but what I wanted to point out is there's a link in this. The link here is actually a link to the regular expression engine that MarkEdit uses. MarkEdit uses the regular expressions bundled into um, the C Sharp framework, uh, actually it's the entire .NET framework. It's very Perl-like, but not exactly Perl. Um, it provides substitutions, back references, all those kind of cool things that you'd want to do in a regular expression uh, engine. And so as we go through these examples, um, a lot of the examples I'm going to show you, um, especially when we get to some of the specific tools like find and replace and copy field, um, the deletions, will be to look at how you can integrate regular expressions into those um, into those responses. Uh, this is also where the listserv comes in really handy. Uh, you'll find that um, that if you are a part of the listserv and search the list archive, or if you happen to be in the, uh, if you happen to um, have questions that are of a specific nature, the listserv has people there who are very well versed in regular expressions, sometimes have better answers than I have. And so I always recommend if you have a regular expression question, regular expression questions, search the list, um, or, or talk specific, ask questions of the listserv. They're great. 
All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get going with this. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about is selective editing. So one of the, the things that comes up on a regular basis um, is you have a large set of records, and there are a lot of different ways to do things um, in MarkEdit. Um, you can pull records together and export them out into small sets of records and deal with them that way. And so you have lots of files that you want to deal with. Um, but the tool actually supports the ability to edit subsets of records. So you can open a large set of records, pull out a subset, edit those directly, and then put them back into um, the file that you started with, an inline file um, that's there. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and what we're going to do is we're going to bounce in and out of the this uh, presentation so you can see how these things work. And so we're going to do that right now. All right, so the Mark Editor, let me get my mouse here. Mark Editor um, is basically from the start screen. This button here opens up a, a notepad. Uh, the notepad is, this is how I like to work with Mark Records. Remember, Mark Edit's been developed um, to work with lots and lots and lots of records all at once. Um, so this kind of notepad -y, you know, structure tends to be, um, from my perspective, the way that uh, I like to interact with that data. So I have um, a set of files here. We'll go ahead and open. This is a small set of uh, 24 records. Um, it's a test set that was uh, given to me by an institution. I've been testing some of the merge and the dedupe functionality, so this will be the one that we work with for a while. All right, so you can provide, you can actually work with a subset of records. So if you go to file and the very poorly named function, individual records to make, um, this actually opens up uh, a tool that allows you to pull out snippets of a file and then edit them later. So you would decide what fields you want to search on if you're going to try and isolate records of a certain type import the file, and then um, either select or search for records that you want to represent the set of records you want to edit. I'm just going to select these two. I'm going to export those selected records. And what you'll see is and there, there used to be 24 records within the editor. Now there are just two, those two records that I've selected for edit. And now I can globally edit those records, these particular records. I can make changes to them um, directly from this screen without having to save them into another file. So I can go ahead and um, uh, I, I'm just going to make a change to the title, one of the titles that I changed just so that we can see it really quickly. Um, and when we're done, uh, you have two options for how this data gets back into the inline file. If you just want to work with this subset and save it as a file, you can use Save As, and that will save these two records into their own file without making changes to the original source. But if I want to actually push these back into the original file, I can just hit Save, and you'll see that it says that the extracted data has been saved back into the original file and has been and has actually updated that original file. So no extra files were needed to be created. Closes, open up the record again, and if I open the, uh, the original test file I was working with, you'll see that it was the second record in the file that that element's been changed. So what I've been able to do is I've been able to work with that subset of data and then push it back into the original source. In a lot of record editing that happens that I hear about, uh, the use cases, um, folks will want to edit parts of a file without having to interact with the rest of the, uh, the file. So this is an easy way to be able to pull out those subsets, make changes, and push them back. All of the functionality that's part of the global editing tools are available to that subset. Mark Edit tracks all the files the same in terms of handling temporary files. You can do special undos. You can run tasks on those subsets. And then when you're finished, you can save those changes back to your source file without having to create lots and lots and lots of files that then maybe have to be managed in some way. So let's go ahead and go back to our slides. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about the next set of um, editing tools. We're going to just bounce through them, and then I'll open up MarkEdit, and we'll go through each one individually and look at how they work.
So mark edit has a find and replace. It works basically like any other find and replace. Um, it supports regular expressions. The difference here uh, and the, the things that you need to remember when working with find and replace and actually when working with all the global editing functions is that mark edit understands a couple of different things. One is it understands character encoding. So when you open a file, it sets the encoding of that, the character set encoding of that data. Is it a Unicode? Is it a Mark 8? Is it um, something else? Um, and based on the encoding in the editor, it sets that for all functions within the global editing tool. So if my file is a big five file, all of the editing functions will interact with that file as if it's all being passed as big five. Um, so something important to know. The other thing is that um, the difference between find and find all and replace and replace all is that when you're working within the paging mode, and MarkEdit has two different methods for reading data files. By default, the paging mode is, is the one that's in place. And essentially what that does is it takes a large file and chops it up uh, virtually so that uh, a set number of records appears on a page. And it does that for loading purposes. All the global editing functions work across that entire page, all of the pages. But the find, individual find function, works just with the data in the loaded page. Find all works across all functions on all pages. Same thing with replace. Replace does individual page replacements. Replace all works across all pages. That's the global function. Um, the way that MarkEdit interacts with those pages within paging modes, it has something called a jump list. Um, this is what a jump list would look like, and we're going to look at that here. We'll, we'll actually screen through them all. Just through here. Um, and so what it does is this will give you in context where your find, uh, where you were searching for something, if you do a find all, where it shows up within the context of the record. So in this case, um, we see the, the find text, so whatever text it was searching in. And then on the other side, you get the action of jumping to record one or jumping to record three, five, six, whatever. Um, so this allows you to move around within the different pages. All right, so let me show you how that works. So let me go ahead and load a little bit larger file so that uh, we have um, a little bit larger set of data here. Grab my data set. Uh, let's see. Bigger set of data. I'll grab this one here. All right, so this is a, a, a larger set of data, and you can see down below, um, right here, this is where the pages are. So Mark Edit is in paging mode here. It shows 100 records per page. I can jump between the pages easily. It does that. So the program virtually has mapped where all the different pages are, and this is done mostly for speed. Um, there's a preview mode that you can use for really gigantic files that even reduces the amount of data that loads. This is probably what most people will use. So if I was going to use the, the find function, like I said, if I was doing an individual find, so if I was searching for online and I use just find, it's going to find that just within this page. And it's going to bounce just for that page. If I search across and do find all, do find all, we get this jump list. And this is where you get that ability to be able to see how each one of those terms has been found within the context of the file. Um, so I can see within record one, there are three versions of the word online, and I can see the context, the field that those show up in. I can export that list. I can copy this, this list that we're seeing right here to the clipboard. That'll copy it to the clipboard. I can save it as a delimited file, so I can go back and look at it later. Um, or I can just go to the version of it that I want, and jump to that page, and then mark edit places me within the context of the search in the record that I'm on the page that I wanted to see. So this way I can jump around within records and see um, how these individual things work. You go ahead and open for file. So the replace function works mostly the same way, but it's it's like any replace function, although it's also, if I was to argue, probably the most 
powerful function within the application because it's the one that has access to all of the data. So that other global editing tools like copy fields, swap fields, those ones do very specific things. This one's designed specifically to give you access to all of the data and allow you to do um, replacements not only at a field by field level but also evaluating multiple fields within a record. Um, so this is where knowing regular expressions is, is a really powerful thing. So I'm going to give you an example. So in this case, we have here um, a set of records that have fast headings. Uh, here's a, a fast heading. The, these are OCLC records that they've enhanced with fast records. Um, I would argue uh, that this field is useless, uh, at least within the context of the way that they've put it in. Uh, I, I like having URIs, not these kind of weird DSNE kind of things. Within that, outside of a library context, I would argue that this is fairly useless information. So what I'm going to do is with my replacement function, I'm going to fix that. And I'm going to have to do it through a regular expression because this data changes. I actually want to change it regardless of what this information is. I'm actually looking for fast, uh, whether it's a fast heading. And I'm going to replace that OCLC DSN with the URL that actually creates the URI. And so to do that, I'm going to create a regular expression. Um, I actually ran this earlier so I can show you something else. So MarkEdit remembers regular expressions that are run. Because, to be honest, it's very rare that you're going to get it right the first time. So in this case, I've, I've done the regular expression. The way that regular expressions work, they break down into groups. So I've grouped things by the field name, by the, the subfield, the term that I want to find, and then the last part is the, um, the data behind the fast heading. So I'm going to then our get it tracks my replacements, so I compare this. This is the replacement that'll run. It's group one, subfield zero, the URI, and then group three. So this is going to allow me to do check regular expressions, run replace all. It modified 25 elements, and I can go back and I can look at my fields, and I can see here that in the fast headings, that subfield zero has gotten rid of the DSN and replaced it with the identifier so that I actually have a, a pure URI. But this shows you the ability to be able to use regular expressions to make changes on a specific field or a group. Um, you could do the exact same thing in do that. You can do the exact same thing in the edit field function. I'm going to bounce out of order here a little bit. Uh, MarkEdit has an edit field function which allows you to get rid of that initial equals 650 part because I can actually limit the operations to a specific field. So if I was going to do the exact same operation, I could do 650 and then I can drop out that equals 650 part and just include something that looks more like this uh, dot star. Um, I'm going to uh, when I get a subfield zero and then I'm going to break out the O, C, O, C, T, and then I'm going to ask it for the rest of the data. So I didn't have to limit it to a specific field because I've already done that by saying that I'm going to edit this just this field grouping. And then my replacement looks basically the same. Dollar sign, zero, um, the URL, ID, and I'm just uh, O, C, L, C, dot org slash, uh, that's not the right URL, but then uh, dollar sign three. So I can do this kind of stuff and then use my regular expressions and process the data. So it's another way of doing the same interaction. A little bit easier regular expression because I've targeted it to a specific field so I don't have to add those groupings. But again, the same thing. Regular expressions when doing this kind of editing is very powerful. Let me go ahead and, and do that really quickly. And we bounce back here. All right. So we did. So we looked at find and replace. Um, so MarkEdit has the ability to do global editing, um, global add, delete, uh, global uh, edit field, which we looked at just a second ago, global swapping, um, copying field data indicators. The global add and delete function has a lot of different things you can do with this. Um, you can add if things aren't present. You can globally delete based on conditions. Um, 
and remove duplicate data. You can process an operation based on a batch of elements. So like if I needed to do a batch deletion or a batch add, I can create a text file that has the, the data that I either want to add or delete and then check the this option. Where's my this option down here, process batch operation, and it'll allow me to point to that file and then execute that. Um, again, everything here is supported through regular expressions. So let's go ahead and uh, look at some common use cases where this might get used. So all of the global editing functions um, are broken into two specific areas. Edit has the find and replace, and then these things called edit shortcuts, which in a lot of ways are, are very complicated regular expressions that I've kind of condensed for people into use cases. So for example, like change case, if you get vendor files where all the titles are in uppercase, you can use this function to be able to tell it to do different casing, apply different casing to a specific field and subfield. Essentially, it's just a regular expression. It's a complicated one, and so Mark Edits provides some shortcuts for you. So this is kind of the, that general edit stuff. The global editing functions tend to live in this tools area, specifically down here on the bottom. You have the add, the copy, edit, indicators, subfields, swapping, um, which allows you to move records or data within the record around, um, and then the, the swap field function. So the add and delete. So the add and delete function, so um, you can go ahead and add data. Um, really easy. Uh, we'll just add a 999 field. And this allows me to, in like that, globally add a record to all the fields. Um, I can also add field, add records based on the presence of a field. So if I go and check add field if present, I can tell it to add a field. This is a test field. If it finds certain data, so in this case, maybe I want it to find, um, I want it to look for the presence of another field. So that's going to like that's only going to add a 998 if there is an 859 in, in within the record, and I know there are a couple, so um, so it adds three. Um, I can add a field only if it's not present. So let's say I, I I think I need to add a URL, but I don't know if all the if the URL already exists within all the records. I can add that based on whether or not it's not present or not. So we know there are three records with an 859. So we're going to add an 859 field here. But only um, if it's not present within the record. And so we go ahead and add it. We know there are three within our 24 records, so that's correct. There should be 21 fields that were added. So that, that allows us to do some, some conditional kind of addition of fields. We can also do deletions. So we can remove duplicate data, we can remove data that doesn't match, and we can do things in a process, batch process, or we can use a regular expression. So the regular expression would allow us to do something like, let's say I don't want to actually have any of the 650s that actually have fast data in them. Um, I can do this one of two ways. I can either use a regular expression, um, which is harder, or I can just say 650 and I'm looking for the word, I'm looking for a subfield too fast and then I'm going to delete that data. That allows me to remove all of the fast headings, and if I go back here, I can see in the 650s, the records that did have fast headings are now gone. It's those, um, those elements. I want them back. I can undo it and bring them back. So now here they are. Um, the special undo allows you to undo one global edit or one task. All right, let's go back to this. Let's say I want to remove a group of data. Um, MarkEdit has the ability to use um, asterisks, uh, uh, wildcards, so um, in an innovative environment when you export all of your data you get a lot of 9xx fields. You can't really have them when you put them back into the record. 9xx, I want them gone, delete them, they're out of here. So now all of the 9xx fields are out of there. You can use that to mark um, granularity, so 9x, 99x would just delete everything in a 990, 0 to 9, um, or, you know, broader that way. Uh, this also allows you to edit, uh, delete fields based on indicators. So let's say I needed to, I wanted to delete data, 
this has to be done as a regular expression. Um, I want to delete all of the 650 fields, but only if their um, second indicator isn't a zero. Um, so that's easy enough to do. I can, I can say that I'm looking at a 650. Um, I, I need to look at indicators, so um, mark edit makes the entire field available, so everything from the equal sign to the end. So I have to um, look at that field this way, so I'm going to say equal 650, or if I wanted to um, just trust that uh, it's all there, I can go dot and then space four. That means any of the first four characters. Um, actually, I know I need to go further than that, so there's two spaces in the, the element, so it's actually any of the first seven characters, because I'm not looking at the first indicator, only the second. And then I'm going to look, and I'm only going to delete things um, that are not uh, zero, so uh, not equal to zero. I did the regular expression right. Um, this should delete any of these elements. Let's see. Look at the 650. Actually, it deleted a few more than I wanted. <laughs> so we'll go back and special undo it. That's what the special undo is for. Regular expressions are sometimes hard to get right off the bat. Um, so I could go back and do it again. But you can see using regular expressions, it opens up more data to you so you can do different kinds of, of processing elements. Um, the remove, if does not match, is great for handling um, data where, say, you have um, provider neutral records, you have a lot of 856 fields, you want to compress them down only to a specific 856 field. Um, what I'm going to do real quick here is uh, 856. I'm going to just add a duplicate here. All right, so if I go back and I look here, I can see that there is an 856 with a proxy and an 856 without a proxy. Let's say I wanted to remove everything but the records that have this proxy element in it. I would capture the data that I want to keep. I would set the field, field data that I want to keep, and then remove if it doesn't match, delete the data. I go back and I look, and you'll see that that 856 that I just created that had the data that doesn't have the proxy in it has been removed. Um, this allows us to do, again, uh, targeted deletions based on the presence of data um, that we might want to be, we might want to keep that's going to flag us as, as information that, that's worth keeping. Here. All right, the program has the ability to edit um, subfield data. The subfield function um, really is designed um, to be able to either drop, replace, drop subfields, so a subfield that you want to get rid of, replace text within the subfield, modify control data. If you enter in a field that's less than 10, the um, data automatically um, converts to looking for positions in subfield, uh, in uh, control data, um, or to um, add new subfield data uh, or move data around. Um, to, I will show you that in one second. Um, the subfield data field, um, UTF-8, regular expressions, new subfields if they're present or not present. Um, and this is what the subfield tool looks like. Uh, let me show you a quick example. Start with a fresh set of data here. So if I open up this edit subfield tool, it's this one right here, and this allows me to either edit data by position. So let's say I wanted to update something in the LDR. Uh, you'll see that this element changed to position. I can now interact with the data at the position level. So position 6, position start at 0, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, so let's say position six, and I want to just change one position. I can search for that specific data element, or I can just change it no matter what. It's going to do that. And then I can go ahead and tell it to replace the text. And we can see here that by that position, that data element changed. Um, I could uh, have used a regular expression in evaluating that data, or I could have used um, uh, simple in string find for that data. Uh, likewise, I can add new elements to a subfield. Uh, I'm just going to do an example. 
uh, let's say a 2z, we're going to put some fake data in here, um, and this is a subfield z, and then I can tell it to um, add that subfield if it's not present, replace the data, we'll see that the data element has been added to the end of the subfield, uh, to the end of the field. By default, all subfields get added to the end of whatever field you're working with. If you need to position subfield within a specific set, remember mark edit is mark agnostic, so it doesn't understand mark 21 rules by default. Let's say I needed to place a subfield in the O2O, and I needed to put it between the Q and the Z. Um, I can do that, but it's a special syntax, and this is in the help file. If you mark, if you go to the main menu in help and open the, the help contents, um, the format is it's a it's a bracket, and then you enter in um, the data that you want to put it uh, before. So I'm going to put it before a Q, and, or uh, after a Q, but before a Z. So Q Z, and if I needed to, I could include also. I'll just include the A2. So that tells me that that's how I'm going to put it. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and add a new subfield, subfield W, added subfield by position. And I'm going to add it if it's not present, replace the text. And now we can see that based on that criteria, the program evaluates, OK, I've seen. Um, I've seen a Z. I know I'm supposed to put it uh, before a Z, um, but I've seen a Q, and I know I'm supposed to put it after the Q, so I'm going to drop it right here. And so it places that new subfield within your position. This used to be the only way that you could add a GMD to a record without have it in the, the kind of order that you wanted it um, after the, uh, what is it, N and P uh, before the CB. Um, now that you have the RDA helper, you can actually just add that GMD without having to go through that process. But this still gives you the ability to um, place uh, subfields within the context of a specific field in a position that you might want to uh, put it into. Let me go to the next set. All right. Um, there's the swap field function. This allows you to move data from one field to another. Um, the swap field function was rewritten recently, uh, well, uh, recently within, say, about uh, six months. Um, so it's, it has some uh, new functionality. Uh, the tool can take data um, based on a field, um, indicators, and subfields. You identify the subfields you want to work with, and it can actually concatenate those subfields together, um, or just move them and, and move them into new subfields based on your criteria. Um, you can process one swap operation per record set by checking the process one field per swap option. Um, you can also tell whether or not you are going to add data to a new field or to an existing field based on uh, the checking of these two options here. Um, this is actually a great way, uh, say for example, if you're an innovative library, to recreate the 945 overlay code. Um, since if you've if you've pulled data out of a mark out of your innovative system, since I believe that the bib number that gets overlaid shows up somewhere in like a 907 subfield B, I think, or something like that, you can actually indicate that you want to move that data into say like a 949. Um, and recreate that overlay field based on data that you're moving from other fields. And uh, just show you that real quick. I'm not going to move, I'm not going to actually create a, a 949, but I'll just swap some data around. Um, so let's say I wanted to move some data. We'll just go ahead and move um, some data that's in the uh, 245 subfield H into another field. So we've got the swap field data. This is very fake, 245. Um, I'm not going to care about indicators, so I'll put asterisks H for the subfield, and I'm just going to drop it into a, uh, a 971. Again, I uh, don't care about indicators. I'm going to move it into a Z, and I'm going to tell it to copy the source rather than deleting the subfield H. I want to keep it, but I want to move it. Um, if I don't check either of these two options, it will create a new field. If I check one of these options, it will add it or create it to an existing field. So I process it. 24 operations are complete. Um, it sorts it into order of numeric um, order, and it uh, 
places it within the context of the record. So you can see that the um, subfield H has been moved to a 947. The H has been changed to a Z. Um, and if I wanted to get rid of these um, elements, I could actually identify those as being not part of the subfield uh, within the uh, find and um, edit part of the tool. So, so that allows me to swap data, and I can keep adding to this. So if I needed to, let's say I was, I was creating a field out of this, I could again move more data. So in this case, let's say I wanted to move what's in the... Uh, uh, 9, 10, um, subfield A, and I'm going to move it to the 9, 7, 1, and I'm going to move it to a P, and I'm going to add it to an existing record and process. And then if I look at this again, you can see that it's added it to my field. So it keeps, I can continue to keep adding data to a, a field that exists. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. So, Mark Edit, uh, we talked earlier about doing character conversions. You can do character conversions on in line within the uh, Mark Editor. There are actually two things, uh, two options here available to you. One is when you save the file, you can actually set the save type when you're um, selecting your file to save. The other is you can actually tell Mark Edit to always save data within a certain character set. Um, that's available within the preferences. So if I go to the preferences and look at the Mark Editor, you'll see that there are some options here available to, to you. Two of them on top are compile records as UTF-8 or compile records as Mark-8. Those two options assume that your data within Mark, the Mark Editor are either in UTF-8 or Mark-8, and the program will um, ensure that the data when compiled um, always is within one of those formats without you having to tell it to do the compilation. It just does it as part of the, the process of creating a Mark record. If you don't set that data, um, then Mark Edit will compile the data that's in the Mark Editor to whatever the character set is that the data is rendered in. So if the data is being worked on in Mark 8 and the diacritics are using the mnemonics, it'll compile the data back into Mark 8. If the data is in UTF-8, it'll compile the data back into UTF-8. Um, you can tell it to um, compile to a specific format, though, by selecting the save type and saying that I want it to be in Mark 8 or I want it to be in UTF-8. So that allows you to, again, target specific character sets as part of the save um, process. Um, but depending on your workflow, like you always need the data in certain formats, you can actually configure the program to work within your workflow that way. Uh, fixing boo-boos, um, I've already showed you the special undo. The special undo allows you to go back and make one, step back and make one, um, remove one global change, or to step back from a task that you've run, uh, and that's actually fairly recent. Um, used to be that when you would run a task that that was done, um, now you can actually step back from a task. Uh, Mark Edit has sorting fields. Um, I'm not going to run these. I'm just going to tell you that they're there. Um, what these do is they allow you to either sort records by, uh, sort the file so that the records are ordered within a certain set. So the control number, title, author, and call number field sorts will take a file and resort the records so that the records show up either in call number order, control number order, title, or author. If you use the sort X, X fields or all fields or custom sort, it actually is going to resort the order of the fields within the record. Um, so two different types of sorts that are available to you. Um, whether or not, uh, I'm not quite sure um, how often they get used, but that's, that's kind of there. Um, the way that Mark Edit knows what a control number is, what a title is, what an author is, a call number is, that's all set in the preferences. So where I went to look at the to look at the editor functionality, the editor preferences. There's an option there in the uh, other um, category where you can set 
which values are the control number, the title, the author, or the call number. Uh, because again, Mark Edit, remember, is Mark agnostic. It doesn't know what a title field is. It doesn't know what a control number field is. Only in cases where it specifically tells you it's applying Mark 21 rules will it make those assumptions. Otherwise, they're just numbers on, in, in the record. Um, and they, they actually mean nothing to the tool. You have to tell it. Give it context around what those values mean. Record deduplication. I had mentioned that um, I had made some changes to the tool. Um, the changes have actually been made specifically to help with deduping on control numbers, actually on any fields. Um, we had a discussion on the listserv about how um, ARC records now are having a lot of 001s and 019s, and the need to be able to use that 019 as a deduping mechanism. So the, the dedupe tool has been modified so that you can actually include multiple control numbers um, in its deduping algorithm. So uh, let me just show you what that looks like. This is a file. This joined file um, has 24 records in it. 12 of them are duplicates. They're the exact same record. Um, the difference is uh, sometimes the records are referenced by this um, 019. And so the, the old mechanism, you would set a control number, so like the 010, and then ask to dedupe. And the program wouldn't have found anything um, because the dedupes happen because the records have been merged or deleted. The way the dedupe tool works now, record deduplication, I can set multiple control numbers. So a pipe, 019, subfield A. So now I'm going to evaluate both the 001 and the 019. I'm going to tell it to drop duplicates into um, a different field. So dupes. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and process the data. 24 items were processed, but if I look at how many records are left, you'll see there are only 12 records left within the file. The program evaluated the data. The first record found is kept. The second record is moved off into that duplicates area. And so MarkEdit has now uh, taken those 24 records and compressed them down to um, the 12. The merge tool has been updated to work the same way. The 001 uh, field is now um, evaluated with the 019 if the Mark 21 merge options are selected. So the tool actually can now merge records so that you can take those data elements and merge them together. Uh, field counts, I mentioned I, uh, field and material type counts. Um, these are reporting mechanisms. The field count gives you a description of all the fields that are used within the record, and then you can break that down to subfields with use, use within the record. Material types allow you to see what mark edit is able to identify as a material type and breaks it down by subtypes, and it uses the leader 008 and GMD to determine, determine those format types. Um, as an enhancement, the program also allows you to group items together so that you can see how um, the application uh, determined what a specific format type is. So if I uh, open this data element here, um, if I go to reports, I can look at field type count. This shows me how many fields are available. If I want to look at a specific field, I can right click on it and ask it to count subfields. It shows me all the subfields and indicators that are within use. I can export this entire set as a tab delimited report so I can see all of the field subfield uses as well as not only occurrences but how many records it's found in. You can go up and I can look at material types. So in this case I can generate the report. Um, there are books, 24 online books. Um, let me get a better record set. That's a, a very diverse set of records. Um, uh, so I can go ahead and grab the set. Uh, this should have a more diverse set. And we can generate the report. Ah, just aims thing. I need a more diverse set of records than that. Okay, uh, let me just take a different set here. There we go. This is a diverse set. Uh, 
So a diverse set of records. So I can look at it, it breaks down by material type and by submaterial type. And if I want to see how Market it's pulling these together, I can go to reports, material type, and find records by type. And then I can ask it to pull those together. So uh, let me see, there are visual materials. So I want to see exactly Mark Edit is finding as a visual material. So I can go ahead and run it, and then it pulls it together as a jump list. So I can see the 34 times that visual materials were found. And then I can actually jump to those records and take a look at them and see why it was assuming that these records are visual materials. Um, that gives me a, ch a way to evaluate records and, and see if material types are being reported differently than I think they should be. If I don't think, if I have a set of records and they should all be electronic resources and Mark Edit thinks that there's something else, this allows you to see why it thinks that there are other types of data within your file set. Pick up the pace a little bit. Um, I don't know what just happened there. There should be more slides. Second, I think the slideshow turned itself off. Yeah, it did. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Task automation. Um, so this is one of those that I, I want to make sure. So Mark Edit. Um, one of the things I've been trying to do ever since I started working with the tools, trying to figure out ways to make it easier for non-program programmers to automate all of these tasks that we have. A lot of times the use case is um, that I have a, a set of practices. I may have 12 operations I'm going to do on a vendor file. I don't want to sit there and have to run each one over and over again when I know I'm going to have to run it every month or every week or whatever. So MarkEdit has what's called task automation. Um, it's the closest that you're going to get to a macro recorder um, within the MarkEdit tool. And the way that it works is there's a manager, and I'm going to create a task so you can see how this works. There's a task manager that allows you to create, clone, rename, delete, or edit tasks. It also allows you to export tasks to save um, and import those tasks at another, um, at another workstation. Um, you can also network your tasks together. So you can tell MarkEdit that your tasks live in a network folder and MarkEdit will go to that folder and you can share a set of tasks between uh, a large number of people, the same tasks, through a networked environment. So let me show you what this looks like and explain how it works. So the network tasks get set up from here. Um, other network tasks folder, this is where you point to the folder where you're going to network your data together. Um, and Mark Edit will always look into that network location. All right, tasks themselves. Let me open my file. Tasks are managed here. You can see manage task. Um, the tool allows you to create new tasks. Uh, so I will create a new task. And it's an empty task. So now I've got an empty task here. It's basically just a, uh, an empty file. I will go ahead and edit that task. I can add a description so that I know what this actually is. And then I can set up um, tasks to specific op operations. Right now, the tasks that can be created are replace all tasks, new field tasks, delete field tasks, edit, subfield, edit subfield, indicator, swap field, copy field. Um, I can actually create a library of tasks and then add that task list to a task. Um, I can tell it that I want to run the RDA helper. Or I can run the linked data task. So we're just going to create a. We're going to create two tasks. One is a, a task library, so you can see it. And then the other one. So we will do um, add a new field. Um, you'll see that the new field looks different. It's kind of this rosy red. That is a visual cue that you're in the task editing tool. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new field. Nine seven. Nine seven one. A new task. So I will go ahead and add that. I can then um, add a delete field task. I'm going to tell it I'm going to get rid of anything that's a 650 with a fast heading. And then I'm going to tell it to go ahead and run the RDA helper. And so those are my three tasks. So I can go ahead and save that. So I have a, I have a task there that does that. I'm going to create a new task. This is going to be like a task library that does the same thing over and over again. So rather than having to clone a task over and over again, I can create a set of common operations. So in this case, 
I always want to add, let's say I always want to add a 500 field that says that it's been uh, uh, edited. So that'll be my, my global task. I'll save that. Go back now to my first one, edit it, and add that task list. And so now that's been added, I'll move it up. And so now the program has these elements, um, the three that I added, plus that task list, which is an external task. And I can run it now. So if I go to Tools, um, Assign Tasks, I can either assign it a key, uh, but I didn't, or I can see all the tasks that are there. Here's the new Carly task. I'll go ahead and run it. And then when it's finished, it tells you all of the operations that have been completed. So it added 24 um, 971 fields. It deleted 25 fields where the 650 had a fast added to it. And it added uh, 24 uh, 590 fields. And then it processed, it did the RDA process. So all of that was done by that one uh, task that I ran. Um, if something doesn't work, so let's say um, I created a task list that referenced a task list that was running, the program would note within this results path that something um, was not, that, that you can't run, um, uh, you had a loop, a, a loop that was invalid, it won't do that. So it'll, it'll make notes of when things can't run too, so that you can see when an operation doesn't complete. And let's say I was done with this and I found that, like the 650 task, I, I looked for just the word fast. In reality, I might have gotten some data that I didn't want to get. I can go back and I can then undo that entire task and go back to where it was before and then rerun, change the task, and then rerun it if I wanted to. Um, so this gives me the ability to be able to create um, automated processes. And like I said, I can export those tasks. So let's say I wanted to send these to somebody else. I can go ahead and select those two items, export the task. Now it's been exported. It's been generated. It generates a file that now I can bring back in. So delete these two tasks. I can bring it back into my tool, importing that task back into my system. Um, wherever I put it, I can't remember. Uh, but I could bring it back in by finding the file and, and importing it back into my, my program. The program will export and keep track of uh, tasks and reference task lists. If you have tasks that reference a task list that reference a task list, there's a point where it stops keeping track of all the references and you may have to go back in and make a couple of changes. Um, but by and large, it does a fairly good job of um, resolving those uh, relationships if you export tasks that, um, that uh, require the presence of another task. Um, you can actually, though, avoid all of this stuff if you're in a common environment. You can just use a network task folder and then uh, have it all there. All right, let's see what's next. All right. Um, uh, so the task automation we looked at, um, harvesting metadata, this was asked by somebody in an earlier session, Mark it has the ability to harvest OAI data and translate it directly into uh, Mark. Um, it supports double and core uh, Mark XML, OAI Mark, and mods by default, um, but you can create your own custom crosswalk and point to it. Um, I have, uh, let's see here, I'll show you how this works, uh, tools, harvest from OAI, um, have a set of data here. Um, uh, I'll pick this one. Um, I can't remember how many records are there, so we're just going to hope that there are current records. One, two thousand fifteen, oh, two, oh, one. So I'm going to set a, a start into it and tell it to go harvest. Oh, whoops, I need to give it a cross mod. one. All right, so I should have looked at this a little bit closer, um, but the OAI request is bad. If I had, I, the, the one I usually like to use as, a, as an example is, is not working right now. But anyways, this is how you would do it. You set your server address, so it's the address to the OAI server uh, minus all of the, uh, 
the elements that go with it, um, the set that you're going to be working with, the material type that you're working with, and then you can go ahead and then tell it to process the data. I just moved process the data. Um, so here you can see that it's trying to go out and harvest the data. I have no idea how many records are here, so we'll probably stop it in mid-run. In mid but as it goes through, it follows resumption tokens. So you'll see um, as it hits a next set, it'll tell you how many records it's harvested as it goes through. Um, I'm going to cancel that, though, because I have no idea how many records are on that set of data. So we will stop there. There's a couple other things I want to get to. If you have questions on that, you can ask me. Working with OCLC connection and OCLC, we're going to patch these together. I'm going to do them back to back. So OCLC has um, an API key. If you ask them for it, they will give it to you. Um, it's a metadata key. This allows you to work directly with um, WorldCat from MarkEdit. You can work with uh, your holdings data as well as your institutional records and master OCLC records. Um, data is done in real time. Operations are available. You can create, read, and update bibliographic records, update and delete institutional records, your holdings code information, um, and create, read, and update local bibliographic data. Um, the holdings information is great. It's at the record level, so if you're doing a withdrawals project, you can actually give MarkEdit a list of CLC numbers and withdraw all the holdings at once. Um, so, just show you how this works. This is all into that and ran out of time, so I want to get to this. So, um, we'll open the editor. Uh, if you want to work with connection, there is a plugin to do that. Um, get to plugins by going to add ins, plugin manager. There's the plugin right there. You download it, open Mark Edit back up. Uh, one of the things you'll run into if you're running a 64-bit system, which I happen to be, if I load the plugin and try and load it, I get this error. Um, connection is a 32-bit application. The database is a 32-bit application. MarkEdit runs a 64-bit application. That's a problem. So there is a way to get around that. There's an option here that says restart in 32-bit mode. It creates a shell around the application. So now it's running as a 32-bit application. I can now open connection, load local bib file, uh, select a record for edit, pull it in, uh, change these records, multiple records globally, and then when I'm done, then when I'm done, save that record back to connection. Uh, so the data goes back. And now if I look at if I look at the uh, records again, you will see, uh, which one did I pull? Is it this one? I forget which one I pulled. Uh, anyways, if we go back and look at it, it's the, okay, building virtual libraries. So if I open that record up again, close these, load uh, is one of these. Yeah, so this is the record that's been changed. One of the things you'll notice is that when we looked at it within the reader, um, the title didn't get updated. Part of the reason for that is MarkEdit's hacking the back-end database. Some of the indexes, I, I don't understand yet how to update, so you'll find that within um, this interface, sometimes they're not represented. The change it might not be represented at the title, but if you look at the data itself, you'll see that the change has been made. And if you open it again, the connection, the change will have been made. Um, within OCLC itself, I've loaded all of the preferences. So once I've loaded my API key and validated the key, I have the ability to use this tab here that says WorldCat. Um, I can search WorldCat directly. And search the database. I can download that record. And then I can make changes to it, and I can upload the record. The caveat here is that I have to have permission. Um, my OCLC permissions have to be set as such so that I can update this record. Mine aren't. Mine's a test, uh, 
test key, so I can't actually update master records. I can certainly create them, but I can't update them, so I can't actually push this up. Um, but that's uh, the process then would be if I made changes, I could go here and, and um, update the bibliographic data, or I could add um, a local bibliographic data element, or I could update the holdings. So this allows me to work directly with OCLC and do it in real time um, and make changes to WorldCat. Where is that useful? I think the Probably the most useful use case that I've come across tends to be holdings manipulation. Um, there are um, some good reasons maybe not to upload bibliographic records in this manner, but it's an option available to you. And, and like I said, the holdings um, seems to be something that is um, uh, used fairly. Um, I'll make sure that we're through everything. Yep, live data. Okay, so I've run it up against 4 o'clock, so hopefully that's not uh, a problem for anybody. Um, but I think that we're at the end of the session, so if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm going to stop sharing this for a second. Just let me know, and we'll go ahead and um, answer them if you have them. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you. So are there any specific questions? Um, I see people are typing, so maybe the answer is yes. Uh, let's see, how do I go back and assign keys to a previously assigned task? Good question. Um, let me uh, show you. Um, it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, within the tasks, the managed task, um, you would have to know what your key assignment is, um, but you can change the keys by essentially selecting a task. Right here, it'll show you if there's a shortcut assigned. It'll show it to you in this tab, so um, I can assign a shortcut here to that task. So you'll see that it's been assigned. If I need to get rid of it, I can just go ahead and select it, um, tell it none, and reassign the key, and it takes the shortcut away. So I can um, remove or update uh, shortcut assignments um, through that uh, interface right there. And the update then is, um, once I've updated it, if I go out to here, um, I'll see that that's been um, reflected within the... Uh, the um, interface here so I can either run the key assignment or it'll show up in the list as being assigned or I can still see it within my uh, currently assigned keys. Uh, let's see here. What's the difference between join records ah, and merge records, and which would you use? That's a good question. So join records is a, is a um, what all that the join records tool does is it takes two files and joins them together. So if I had um, if I had the exact same set of records and I just used the join tool, it would just turn them into a single file with two copies of the same record. The merge files is where, say I have a set of OCLC records and I have a set of local records and I want to merge data or a set of vendor records and my local records and I want to merge some data from one element into my source records. I can use the merge tool to then pull data from um, one set of uh, resources into another. So um, uh, a good example of that would be um, uh, let's say I have my local source records and I have my vendor records and the vendor records have the URL that I want to put into my source records. I can use the merge tool to just take that one field and put it into my source records. Um, 
and there's a there's a another YouTube video if you actually want to uh, see the whole process behind that. Um, like I said, there's been some changes to the to the merge tool to make it a little bit smarter, but um, but that's how it works. It the merge tool works to some degree kind of like OCLCs. Um, it matches on something like 36 data points, creates an algorithm that, that creates a, a, a confidence level of match, and then will um, collapse data together. Um, based on that that, uh, that confidence level. So uh, the idea is to, rather than the join tool where it's just only putting files together, it's actually making some um, evaluations and pulling specific data elements. And one of the changes to the merge tool that was recent um, was the ability to have the tool merge um, fields if they're not duplicates. So let's say I have a, I have a vendor record that has some subjects I would like to take and a URL. I could tell it to merge just the subject fields and the URL field, but only if they're unique. So the tool would actually not duplicate subject fields if they were duplicated. It would just take the unique ones and then it would take the URL so that you could do that kind of uh, more granular merging of data. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, the other question was I'd mentioned deduping between the OCLC number in the 001 and the 019. Um, the first record and, and discard the second. So you actually have an option to ask the record to take um, transaction date into a, into account. Um, by default, um, uh, it doesn't um, because it's it's uh, some a lot of times that isn't the use case that people have asked for. But if you look at the record dedupe tool here, um, you can set the OCLC number like I had said. Um, but this down here is the transaction date, so I can tell the tool to um, utilize the transaction date to break the tie. So what happens is when MarkEdit reads the record set the first time, it tracks um, the relationships between the control numbers and creates a linked list, and then it also keeps track of transaction date so that it can keep just the most recent record and the records that are older get pushed into that duplication file if you ask it to keep track of um, the records that it's removing as dupes. Um, so that you can maybe look at them later. So you can actually dedupe on a transaction date to get the most current record um, if you have a record set that has duplicates and one is older and one is newer. And like I said, the dedupe tool has had um, some, some significant changes made to it. The, the deduping on multiple control numbers, that's, that's new work that will be showing up um, in an update, uh, most likely tonight. Um, I admit I was going to do it last night, but I didn't want there to be problems with this particular webinar, so I held it so that I could make sure I did this, and then and I'll post the update for folks. Um, so are there any other questions? One of the things I will say uh, for the folks who are left, I, I love hearing from people that are using the OCLC. If, if you use the OCLC integrations, um, I know OCLC is very interested in that because they've been making their APIs available and, and we worked quite a bit to make this work and to try and figure out what's missing in their metadata API and there are still some, some significant gaps. Um, but one of the things that, that, um, that I would like to hear is, is um, if people are actually finding that kind of integration useful. Um, I've been trying to work with ILS vendors to provide the same kind of integration in MarkEdit. Um, right now it's just with Koha because they're, and, and Evergreen, they're the only systems that have um, an API that's a right API that's openly available. Uh, when I was um, in Oregon and, and they were making the move to Alma, um, there was some discussions about potentially getting access to that API, but since I'm not a, a customer, um, and um, in reality with it, with MarkEdit, it would be more in a, um, a non-institutional uh, specific way. Um, I haven't had a lot of luck working with vendors to, to make that available. So if you happen to work at an institution that um, has some kind of API and you were willing to work as a go-between, it would be interesting to see how we could potentially um, build connections between specific ILS systems if they're available.